before we set right our uh, this thing, what I want to talk to you is uh, something called okay. Anyway, <clears throat> see now we have talked about the devices that we can control the particulate matters okay, or the dust. Now, we want to control both in this thing you can control both particulate matter plus gases okay. and the system looks like this. Unfortunately, I do not have the figure for this. approximate drawing okay. and this is called venturi scrubber. So, here you pass your particulate matter and gas for example, let us take the gas as H f. Okay. This I am giving example it can be other any other gas. So, this part of the venturi is called convergence This is called divergence and this is called throat. Okay. The challenge is of course, the particles which are smaller in size is difficult to remove. Right? Okay. In here, you have little openings okay. and I am making some drawing which not does not may not look very good, but I think we have to be the meaning has to be clear. You have this scrubbing solution that can be water or that can be some other chemical. Okay. So, what you do is that you bring this, this scrubber liquid and with these holes you can go a little bit inside in the depth and you can drip the liquid water, water or whatever is the scrubbing solution. For H f, what could be the scrubbing solution for H f if we call Na 2 CO 3. You remember we talked about the wet scrubbing for the aluminum plants. right? So, this could be ordinarily it could be water or Na 2 CO 3 depending on what you want to remove. So, here you have the particulate matter and the H f as it goes through the convergence area, it acquires very high velocity obviously. Okay. Okay. It requires a high velocity and the particles are released. These particle water droplets will be fairly large particles, maybe 0.5 mm, 1 mm that sort of thing. Whereas, the particles that we want to remove are very fine particles like something from 10 micron meter to about 0.5 micron meter, smaller particles, larger particles you could remove very easily with many of the methods. So, here <coughs> two things happen as this thing comes in the divergence area, okay, the velocity of these water particles or the scrubber particles will be smaller, okay, will be smaller and the velocity of the gases that will be faster. Okay. If you go in the convergence area, 
what will be happen? Then there will be relative velocity between the water droplets and the particles that are traveling. Okay. Who is traveling faster? The particulate matter is traveling faster, whereas the little droplets of water is traveling slowly. When there is a relative velocity between two things, what is the result? They collide. Right? When there is a relative velocity, okay, if somebody is moving at the higher speed and somebody is, somebody is moving with the lower speed, thing coming from the higher speed is likely to hit that one. Okay. So, what happens in this process? Okay, there is a relative velocity in this range. Okay. This relative velocity, because of this, there is an impaction of the particles onto the water droplets. Okay, and the particle will become part of the water droplet. Okay, okay. So, and then many particles can go inside one water droplet. Okay, okay. So, in this process, in this, in this way, what happened? The large, smaller particles are encased into the larger water particles. See, and how we accomplish this? This was accomplished because we could generate, we could give a relative velocity between the particles that are traveling through this one and the water droplets or the liquid which is matter of your liking depending on what gas you want to remove. So, there are two things are happening. The particles are being encased inside the water droplet and as well as there is the opportunity for the gases which may be H f to react with your scrubbing liquid. So, that H f will be removed because you, have, you are giving them the enough time, this can be long enough, you are giving them the enough time to get reaction and get so that H f is neutralized. H f is an acid, okay. it is like it is like acid. So, that gets neutralized. Now, what happens is particles, all the particles have like almost have become the size of water droplets, because they are sitting inside that one. Okay. Now, once the size is large, okay, it is very easy to remove. Okay. Then what we do? We provide another simple cyclone after this one. So, by virtue of this what I have done, I am not getting com complicated as ESP or back filters, okay. but here I am removing the gaseous as well as the particulate matter, but what I really need after this one is to put another particulate removal device okay. and that is what I want you to understand. Okay. So, that we can <coughs> remove the particulate as well as the gaseous sample. So, this is what is called the venturi scrubber, because this is in the shape of venturi. Do you have anything which the physics part which you do not understand to what I said. Okay. Some material I will send it to you through email, but just what I want is that you understand the physics. Okay. Simple thing, but then you need to understand and as you will grow, as you will go down, the, there will be no more relative velocity, the particles as well as the, uh, partic the particulate matter as well as the liquid droplets, they will travel at the same speed. So, your efficiency of your collection or hitting each other will reduce with time. Okay. This is what is the thing. So, this is what is the venture scrubber. The other thing which I have not talked to you is about SO2 removal, but you can also use the SO2 and use some another thing, another liquid like for example, slurry of calcium carbonate, okay, calcium carbonate and sulfur dioxide will react, but that part I will send it through email. But I want to talk something, <coughs> well hopefully if this cooperate. Normally, uh, most of the textbooks, they do not spend so much time on this one, but in my opinion, this to understand this thing is again very, very important. If you are going to be part of an industry okay, and working on to the air pollution and helping them to improve the air quality you will invariably you will encounter with this situation. There is no doubt about that. So, how do we do this stack measurements? Okay. How do we know what is the pollution that is going out? Okay. So, some picture which is shown here again this is not very clear picture, but what you see here is a little platform okay. and then you see a person standing right, the person who is standing and there is little some kind of you know beam or bar if you like it and something is hanging onto this bar, this can move in and out. Okay. Like there is a guide rail, you suppose this like this is the weight which you see here that can move back and forth forward. Okay. Okay. So, this is how the sampling is done, but we will get again we will get into the physics part. Okay. Why do the monitoring, why stack sampling is required? 
I will pass on this to, through to, you, to you through email. See, suppose you are, a, you are a chemical engineer, you want to see the process control, okay. You want to see, well, the, the percentage of carbon dioxide should be so much, okay. Or you want to say, okay, this chemical compound is being formed or not. You are a combustion engineer, you want to see what is the oxygen level, okay. That is why again, then you say, okay, if oxygen level is low or high, you want to increase or decrease that one. Is not it? All process control people would like to see what is happening inside the stack or inside the duct. Regulatory compliance you say the pollution control boards they will come and say oh let me see what are your emissions because there is a law that you cannot discharge more than certain concentration of the particles or gases and things like that. So, they will require stack measurements, air quality modeling for modeling what you need? you need the emission quantity Q, the big Q that we, are, we were writing all the time in the formula. Where that Q will come? Either it comes from the emission inventory or if you want to be very, very accurate, you actually go and measure it. Because emission inventories are always estimates. Okay? If you want to write actual, then you go and measure do thing. Development of the emission factors, okay? that emission factor you want to say and you want to check the performance of the pollution control device. You have an ESP for example that we spend lots of money in there, then you want to see how good it is working. So, you will say one stack measurement here and you see one stack measurement here and you see the difference and see how efficient is your ESP. Okay. You need to know certain basic things to do the stack sampling that you all are aware of that one, we will not spend any time onto that one. Now, I want to talk to you something you have not heard, but something very important and all our lecture today will be focused on that particular thing. When you talk about the sampling, sampling are two things you want, you can possibly sample, the gases and the particles, right. The gases because of you know the diffusion, they are, their concentration is uniform all across the chimney, okay. But you will see the particle concentration will vary from location to location that is point number one. And then, so what we do is that we sample the particulates with something called isokinetic sampling. I okay. will explain you what is isokinetic sampling, but before we do that, you have to answer certain thing. Suppose, this is my duct or chimney. I put a sampling device to take the sample. Okay. Here is my let us say pump. and here is my filter paper. Okay. What I do is suck through this one, take the initial weight, final weight, measure the flow. Suppose, I am, this is my velocity inside the chimney or in the duct. That is let us say velocity stack is V s. Okay. And you want to, you are sucking it through some velocity and that velocity here, okay, in this one let me call that as V n. Okay. Okay. When V s equals to V n, you call it isokinetic sample, because the kinetic energy here, here and here is the same. And it is very important to maintain isokinetic sample. Okay. Now, <coughs> Having said it is very easy, but then you will ask why it is important. Okay. Tell me if my V s is greater than V n, okay. what will happen? Will I collect a representative sample or I will make a mistake in sample? I will make a mistake in the sample. Okay. <coughs> you are sucking, you are, you, are, you are sucking with a smaller velocity. So, I will report higher concentration or the lower concentration lower concentration, okay. but then the question is why lower concentration? Particle escaping where? Particle escaping outside or inside? If they are out escaping outside, then I am collecting less, so I must should report less. Is that what you are saying that you report less or you report more? Report less. Is anyone who is with me when I say you will report higher. 
why sampling velocity is lower stack velocity is higher but you are sucking at the lower speed the answer what you said is just opposite and then you have to understand why it is so so when you are sucking this is your sucking velocity right when sucking is smaller okay what will happen we will will answer with the next slide so that is situation number 1 and then another situation is what i am saying is and will 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 clarify under report or over report sorry over report the particulate concentration you will under report generally feeling is like this that you are sucking with a high velocity and you will expect more will come okay that's what is general tendency but this is not true and that will become clear with the next slide so that i don't have to make the picture again and i will explain you in a moment you have to think that particles have the inertia okay so here <coughs> so this you see here the velocity is the same this here and here okay now you are saying here the flow rate okay the sucking flow rate is is lower okay sucking flow rate is over which one is which is my case this one right sucking flow rate is lower this is higher do you see here the same thing what is that my flow rate okay flow rate isokinetic sampling rate is higher isokinetic rate is higher okay isokinetic rate is higher so i am under this condition so, what will happen when you are sucking isokinetic rate is higher. So, what you do is that part all the particles are sitting here. Okay. When you are sucking higher, you are able to suck the gases inside. Okay. Correct? But the particles will have its own inertia and they will continue to travel. See here again, what is that? My I have the isokinetic rate is high. So, means I am sucking with a higher velocity when I am checking the higher velocity all gases which is close to them they will enter where the particles which were there in the stream of gases they will say okay gases are less inertia they can go into the nozzle but particle will continue to fire follow their trajectory. So, this particle suppose let us talk about the extreme gas this this stream there is a particle sitting here when you said isokinetic rate is higher you suck in with the higher this thing. So, the gas will come inside this one where the particle sitting here it will continue to go like this and get escaped. Okay. Is that clear? We are oversampling because you are you are you are taking the more volume of air, but that for that volume, whatever the particle was there, that you have not captured in your filter paper. That particle you have you have sampled the corresponding gas, but that corresponding particle has escaped. Okay. Is that everyone? Simple thing but is that does everyone see that point clear you have to be absolutely clear so, how particles, which are more particles. Uh -huh. which are more than some particles 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 will generally have the inertia compared to the gases so very fine particles below 0.1 or something that you can treat them as a gases maybe that that problem may not be that severe but we are when the stack the particles can be anywhere from 150 to 1 micron somebody had the question how it is under reported? It is under reported because you are you have taken the gas volume, okay, but the particle mass has not come. See if you had taken all the gas, all the particles that was fine, mass upon volume. So, <coughs> you have been able to select suck the same volume, but this mass the particle got escaped. What is the concentration is mass upon volume, milligram per meter cube. This this mass this was mass was here that got escaped okay whereas volume you have sucked through because you had the very high velocity okay clear so what will happen in the, this case you will under report okay the situation is like this for example okay then you will over report because the the the, the particles okay will continue to move but the gases will escape 
okay. Then you are getting more mass, but corresponding volume you are not taking. That is what is the physics that you have to understand. So, <coughs> very quickly, what is what has become most important for us is the right measurement of velocity, okay, right measurement of the velocity and ensuring that velocity inside the chimney is same as the velocity at the nozzle. Job is done. But life is a little bit more complicated than this thing. You see, if I go and see the velocity profile in the duct, which is normally turbulent, in the duct the flow is always turbulent for the gases. So, you see the profile typically looks like this, not even parabolic what you see, you have seen for the water and anything. For quite a distance this is 0 and then you get this one. So, in that case, if I take the few points 1, 2, 3, I get the velocity profile. Okay. I need to need to have good knowledge of the velocity. If I make mistake about the velocity, my sampling is doomed. Okay. But unfortunately, this is a very ideal situation. We do not get that. If you go to the power plant, if you go to the chemical plant, you see the, the, the ducts are like this, then there is a fan here and the duct turns like this okay. and then suddenly there is expansion in the duct and then again it goes like this and then, then again there is a turn and things like that. So, unfortunately, this kind of velocity profile cannot be maintained. You see, if things are turbulent and changing and there is a cyclonic action and there may be a damper, uh, you know, to cut down the flow and things like that. So, if I keep on taking the profiles, okay, my profile will never be like this, only under very ideal condition. And who disturbs the profile, the velocity profile are these things, bands, okay, expansion contractions, ID fan, FD fans, dampers, ducts and these things all cause your velocity profile to change. Okay. Therefore, I, I cannot make the measurement at just one point. Okay. I, this is a challenge for me that I have to still get a good velocity profile. It means, I should take more measurements of the velocity. Okay. In that case, I should take more measurements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. So, that so that I get the complete profile. If I have very good picture like this, maybe I take 1, 2, 3, I am happy. Okay. But unfortunately, when you do onto the field, you go into the field, it is never like this. And what is in the field is that is all I will show you. This is actual measurement done by myself okay. and I will show you what happens there. <coughs> See here, what you are seeing here is a measurement done at various time. Okay. Here, you see here velocity profile is not the perfect profile what you see. The reason why it was there, the velocity profile in 90 degree band in the upstream, there was a band which is, it was actually like this was done in a power plant called Badarpur power station. Okay. There was a band like this. And we were having the measurements it was a duct, horizontal duct. We are doing the measurements here. Okay. Then once you do the measurement, you see things are pushed onto the side. Okay. As a result, the velocity which was should be the 0 or something was highest at this point. Okay. So, suppose if I taken only one point, I will make terrible mistakes. Okay. So, we do not want to do that. This was another situation, same plant, but another chimney there. So, you see the flow was just reversed. What was the problem? spatial variation in velocity profile why a 90 degree band in the downstream okay and and dampers expansion and i d fan in the upstream so there was expansion in this one it was coming like this okay and then there was expansion and then there was a duct here and then it followed and we were taking the samples inside the duct so, there was expansion. Okay. Once there is expansion, the velocity increased at the ends and it was decreased less. Okay. So, again <coughs> when we have said that velocity measurement is the most important or the key things, but then actual situation can make the things very difficult. Okay. So, really before going to the sample, we must determine how many data points that we want to take okay. and that is decided by what is at my sampling location, what is there in the downstream and what is there on the upstream. If there is things have very long duct, you have nice duct, you can do with the minimum number of samples. Okay. 
So, if you realize we agree with this one that we have to decide about the number of samples, how do we go about doing that? This is a little picture to show how do we measure the velocity, okay. just you have to understand the principle, this is called the pitot tube. Okay. The pitot tube one thing, this is inside the chimney, so this opening here and there is the opening here. Okay. So, the gases they will put the pressure here, the atmospheric pressure will come and the pressure difference is there nothing but velocity head. Okay. So, <coughs> there are certain formula corrections are there, but the underlying principle is this, you see the change in the delta h okay, and that is this delta h and I can find out the velocity. Okay. Just the principal part, okay. the things may be little different you know, uh, the constants are there and, and pitot tube constants and things like that, but this is what we call as the pitot tube and this is called S type of pitot tube. Okay. But then the question that we are trying to answer is how do we decide number of data points. Okay. Look at this picture. Suppose I am doing the sampling here, okay. somewhere here at distance b there is a disturbance right? and at a there is a disturbance there is expansion. Okay. So, what you do is that you see in your if I am going this side my flow is like this, this direction is my upstream or downstream? Upstream okay. and when I am going this side this is my downstream. Okay. Then I see where is my disturbance, how far is my disturbance from the my sampling point. So, in terms of the diameter, how, how many diameters I have. So, suppose if I my disturbance is in the upstream is let us say 8 times. Okay. So, my disturbance is let us say my A, is that right? We are, we are calling B, okay. we call it B. in upstream. Okay. It means I am somewhere here right? and suppose my A is 2 times in downstream. <coughs> you have to see the scale up. Okay. This is 2, right? okay. 2. I can bring it down to this 8 and 2 and you get to this point. Okay. You can see that I get to this point. This is what is my ideal situation and this is what is my ideal situation. Okay. It means if I am my disturbance is at a distance more than 8 d, I have no problem and if it is more than 2 d in the downstream, okay, I have no problem then the factor which is important is 1 multiplying factor is 1. I will explain you where this multiplying factor is to be used is <coughs> if I extend this is equal to 1. Okay. Suppose I have the disturbance, suppose my disturbance is let us say is only distance of 6 d means I am measuring somewhere here, okay. then this distance is only 6 d. So, then I go from 6 and go here and get a multiplying factor of 1.5. Right? Okay. What is this where this multiplying factor is to be used is that there is a rule that you have to have minimum number of points velocity measurement points. So, you multiply this one suppose minimum was x. So, but you have the disturbance. So, you said 1.5 times x. So, that many number of measurements you must take inside the chimney. Okay what is that minimum which that you have to multiply with this factor becomes clear in this one. Depending on your internal diameter these are the number of points minimum number of points that are required provided you are meeting this criteria. If you are not meeting that criteria then multiply these minimum numbers with the factor that we got. Okay, suppose we got the 1.5 and we our duct diameter was let us say 1.2 uh, internal diameter. 1.2 required 12. So, we multiply this by 1.5. So, 12 into 1.5 are the minimum number of points that I need to take inside the duct to do the velocity measurement. Is that clear what I said to everyone? All right. Suppose 
you said all right let us take the example here that I D the internal diameter was 1.2 and the factor was 1.2. So, for this 1.2 minimum we required is 12 points ok, but unfortunately because of disturbance we got the multiplying factor as 1.5. So, this becomes something like this 18 ok good. So, I need to take 18 points inside the chimney. So, that is to ensure that I will get a good velocity profile and I will not make mistakes ok. Is that point clear? Now, the next question automatically comes where do I take those 18 points ok. There is infinite location inside the duct or inside the chimney ok. Then I will show you where those 18 points can be taken. This is little table that you have to spend little time understanding this one. Okay, I do not think you can read it so well there. Okay. This is your traverse point number okay. and how this is numbered is like this. This is your, your chimney cross section you divide things in two parts ok. Then suppose my point number 1, we do not know where the location is, but let me write here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 ok. Suppose <coughs> then you can say 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and we always measure from the two directions ok, this direction and this direction. So, suppose you had you were required to have the 12 points. So, on one axis ok and then other axis orthogonal to this you require 6 points is that right 1, 2, 3, 6 points. So, where those 6 points should come ok. I have taken an example for the 8 points ok. See here what you have to do is you are suppose you are taking as ok. You see here 8 points this is the percentage diameter distance starting from the edge ok. So, you have decided that you want to have the 8 data points ok. Let us make it 8. So, there is no confusion here. So, you totally wanted 16 and 8 in one direction. So, I can make it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 ok. So, you want the 8 data points. Your point number 1 here you say point number 1 total is 8, where it should be 3.3 percent of diameter. So, my point number 1, this distance ok is 3.3 by 100 this distance from the inside the wall of the chimney that is will be 3.3 percentage you I, I, I do not know if you can see, read somewhere it must be percentage somewhere does it say anywhere percent of strike diameter ok from inside wall of the uh, chimney. So, you can see my this point is at this distance ok point number 2 10.5 my this distance Ten point two by hundred times D. So that is my this distance, right? Clear? Okay. Let's take the eight point for example. Okay, ninety six point seven. Okay, this is my eight point. Then I'm looking at this distance. I don't know if you can see that. Miss my eight point from here to here that is what is this 96 point something what is that 96.7. So, 
so 96.7 by 100 times t clear so you can really locate the points where you want to take the sample clear and that is what I have written here exactly suppose you have the T p is traverse point you need 8 number of traverse points look downward look downward and locate at 3.3 10.5 percentage dia clear and this is what is again shown and the little thing you want to be careful sometimes we do inside the duct okay horizontal duct which may be rectangular things like that. So, <coughs> whatever number of points you have got okay for example 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 you divide this into that many equal parts okay and then you can do and then how, how will you find out number of points that is required that will be you find out the equivalent diameter d e and use the concept that a and b that I talked about for this particular diameter okay because this does not have any diameter right and the figure which we showed you earlier was only having the d factor. So, you for this thing you find out the equivalent diameter and then apply the same concept number of data points required depending on the disturbances upstream and downstream then you can locate and say ok we need that much points. Is that clear that you can do for the rectangle ok. There is some special requirements are there the diameter is there some what should be the the, the opening here etcetera etcetera those are more a technical thing not that of physics part so that you do not have to worry but those are things are specification are there because here you have to put your sampling thing inside. So, there should be some opening diameter and things like that and that is given how much should be the diameter and things like that the details are given here this is 10 centimeter and there is a flange which you can open from the nut and bolt. Okay. This is little requirement of the stack how you have to the weights the loads that will come and then you have to provide some uh, platform and things like that those details are there those are very standard things that you can look into, but let us see where we have to understand the things ok it is little opening that you see for the, the where you go the sampling probe goes inside here you sit down with your monitors and calculators and things like that ok and then you find out the you have to find out the velocity on the spot because based on that velocity only you will fix the velocity at the nozzle right unless you find out the stack velocity how will you fix the nozzle velocity you cannot fix. So, immediately you take the measurements with the pitot tube run through the calculator or computer with the spreadsheet and uh, suppose you got the 20 points you have taken and with your spreadsheet immediately will give you the velocity at 20 points ok. So, now you are you know if you put your sampling probe here what should be the velocity that you should maintain at the tip of the nozzle right ok. Ok, this person again this is not very clear to you this person is really doing the sampling and and there is a guide rod is there ok and then he is this is a sampler which he can push back and forth. So, if I want suppose I want I can take the sample here I can take the sample here I can take the here and normally we to take at many places to get a representative sample. Why we take the representative sample? <coughs> because the velocity is let us say like this ok higher is the velocity it will because the energy is higher it will have the larger particles right concentration larger particles will more. So, if I do most of the sampling here I will still do it isokinetically but I might lose some of the particles that are there which are the larger in diameter okay. and I want to take a representative sample. So, we do not take it uh, we do it isokinetically at all places, but we do it many places ok not at one place alone ok. Now, how to ensure isokinetic sampling that is a key you have done the measurements and things like that. Now, how do you ensure that well the V s is equal to V n ok ok. So, we have to ensure velocity in the stack is equal to velocity at the sampling nozzle ok and normally what we will do we have the measurement we have a rotameter 
to measure the flow, you want to measure the flow with what, what flow rate that you are measuring because ultimately this flow rate will go in your calculation mass divided by the volume, the volume will come from the flow rate. So, we have the rotameter and there is a pump concept. Adjust the flow rate at rotameter okay, so that V s equal to V n. You know the V s very well because you have done the measurement okay. and now you know the diameter of this one little thing there. So, you can adjust the flow rate with little knob. So, to ensure that this V s is equals to the V n. Okay. If you can ensure that one and where do you ensure, how do you ensure, you ensure from the adjustments you make it here. Okay. If you have ensured that means V s equal to V n, any doubt? Okay. So, then what I can do, I have to find out the Q that I want to adjust at the rotameter. Right. That is nothing but the area of the nozzle times the velocity, that is the flow rate. This is fixed, okay. this is variable because the stack velocity may vary. Okay. So, this is fixed. So, I multiply this and I get the flow rate q that I can keep on adjusting here. So, I can, so I have to calculate it beforehand. I take the q let us say 40 lpm, then I move the sampler to the second location and make it 60 lpm because velocity is different here and the nozzle is the same. Okay. So, you see here I have to keep on adjusting my flow rate as I travel across the chimney. Okay. All right. <coughs> life is not so simple. Uh, we have not done the job, concept wise we are okay, but the situation wise we are not correct. Okay. That what I, what I state, equation 1 is not quite right, okay. although it looks right. Why? We want q in the stack, where is the q we want? In here and, but where are the measurements you are doing? In here. right? pressure and temperature is different here and pressure and temperatures are different here. So, that q I am maintaining which I am measuring here has a pressure and temperature here which is not correct there. right? So, I must make an adjustment for the pressure and temperature which I know which I can do the measurement of pressure and temperature here. So, I must make the correction for the pressure and temperature which I am measuring so that it becomes exactly V s equal to V n. So, did we say that here? Can only be measured outside at the rotameter. Rotameter temperature and pressure is different than stack. So, therefore, we need to revise Q. Okay. How do we revise? This is fixed. Okay. The volume you can revise. That volume okay, you are measuring at T m. So, you buy T m by T s p 1 v 1 upon t 1, you can see that how you will get t m by t s, okay. because you are here measuring at the t m, but you want to the required thing was at t s. Similarly, you need to revise it for the pressure part, okay. that, that is the p bar, okay. that is your atmospheric pressure minus p meter, okay. that is the difference is that you get the absolute pressure and similarly p bar minus p s, p s is a stack pressure. Okay. So, that way you can now if you maintain this particular q at your rotameter that will ensure that your velocity inside the chimney is same as it is in the nozzle. Okay. Is that clear to you? Okay. If it is not clear to you, I will send this one to you all of you. You reorganize and see if this is what it is coming out to be. Okay. You do because if you will do with your own hands, okay, you will become more happy and more clear ki yes, this is what is the thing which I have to change. Okay. There is another situation where we are we, we condense the moisture beforehand. See stacks are likely to have the moisture, right? H2O is one of the combustion products. So, in the process when you are sucking, it can condense. So, if that is condensation is already removed okay, before you are measuring at the rotameter, because the condensation why we do is we remove the condensation, because otherwise it can spoil my rotameter, it can cause the corrosion inside the rotameter. So, I want to trap the moisture beforehand. So, if that moisture is removed, okay, the V meter that you have measured okay, must be lowered, because 
that V V is you have already taken into the consideration. This I will send it to you through mail today and then you have to go through this okay. and you make sure that you are getting the same formulation as I get. If not come back to me okay. we can discuss and sort this one out. You become expert on the stack sampling this is what is typically the things might look like inside there is a nozzle here there is a filter paper which we call as thimble okay. and thimble looks like this. Okay. This is clamped here but this can move in and out. Okay. You bring it here you bring to the condenser because it's the water you want to condense that one you measure you measure the dry gas meter that is the flow meter that you can adjust and there is a pressure pressure and temperature and this is the flow that you can measure and finally, you have the vacuum pump. So, that you can make sure basically difference in the weight divided by the volume that you have taken. So, that way you can find also this is the last picture actually on the field it looks like this along with this what you are doing is you are putting the nozzle, but you are also putting your pitot tube along with this one. Why you want to put the pitot tube along with this one you want to ensure that velocity that you had measured earlier is still maintained in the duct. Suppose the velocity has changed because I said with temperature with time velocity can change generally it do not. So, that you can calculate at the end of the day percent isokinetic okay, because you are doing it with some measurements which you did earlier okay, and by the time you did your calculation you are ready to go with this one the after 10 minutes or after 15 minutes it take for the preparation the velocity has changed. So, that you can say how much was the change in the velocity because you can still record the velocity because of the petot tube. At the, at the point only, so, but you are doing the measurement at the point only you are doing the measurement here. Okay. Then after 5 minutes of sampling you push your sampling prop at point 2 and take the 5 minute sampling then push to 3 again 5 minute sampling. So, at that point you are re, re measuring the velocity and compare it with the earlier velocity that you had measured and say well you are still close to what you had measured. Suppose there is a drastic difference it means your sampling is incorrect then you have to probably repeat the sample. 